So, schönen guten Abend. Hi. Good evening. Herzlich willkommen in die Heinrich Böll Stiftung. A warm welcome. Welcome to the Heinrich Böll Foundation. It's nice to see you all here. That uh, you um, discuss educational issues and also um, participation, exclusion, racism is going to be discussed here today. Mm. We've got scholars today here, and Professor Jabari Mahiri, who has uh, recently. Uh, published the book Deconstructing Race, Multicultural Education Beyond the Color Bind. He will uh, pr present us the main uh, uh, tenets of his book, and then um, he will discuss with uh, Professor Maisha Auma from the Magdeburg uh, um, <coughs> University and Peggy Bischer from the Gunnar Werner Institute of the Heinrich Bell Foundation. Um, we have the title White and Monolingual. That's the picture of the staff rooms in most of the German schools, while at the same time, the bi- and multilingualism is the normality in the classrooms. So we chose this title to also shift the perspective because bi- and multilingualism has also been considered as something a deficiency as a deficit rather than something which enriches a society and also shows the uh, uh, capacity and uh, potential of uh, students. So we are looking forward on how much of your ideas and your theory and your um, researches can be also transferred to our debate here in Germany. And for that matter, we have very distinguished uh, discussants with Maisha Oma and Peggy Bischer. And thank you so much again for being here. And I uh, give an this to my colleague Peggy, Peggy Bischer. So I would like to pass uh, on the, uh, the floor to Peggy Bischer, who's going to introduce uh, the, the subject matter. Um, this introduction, especially also thank you for putting all of this together. That was uh, um, kind of uh, very shortly put together and then so successfully. I'm very impressed. And um, when we talked about that two weeks ago, I thought, oh, wow, <laughs> at the end of the year now, <laughs> where we all are um, basically living in our computers, getting everything finished and up to the deadline. Um, but then uh, I was very, very happy that we can make that possible because uh, this is a, um, a really a wonderful and great opportunity to get our discussions, which we actually have all year long in one room and getting it connected in the um, uh, African diasporic uh, uh, discourses. So I'm very happy. I feel very honored to um, uh, introduce uh, our today's speaker um, and also then chair the um, discussion uh, uh, session afterwards. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Professor Mahir first and then um, after his talk, I will introduce uh, Professor Auma. Please bear with me um, for, uh, with my language. Uh, my brain is already actually dead for this year. It's already gone for December uh, 31st. Um, but we decided to uh, do um, this all in English and alle Übersetzungsmöglichkeiten, das haben Sie ja schon wahrgenommen. In der Diskussion ist es dann auch möglich, natürlich in beiden. But of course, during the discussion it's possible. Uh, uh, you can also take German and uh, English uh, questions and comments. As a professor of education and an inaugural holder of the William and Mary Jane Brynton Family Chair in Urban Teaching at the University of California in Berkeley, he is faculty director and multicultural 
in, uh, of the Multicultural Urban Secondary English MA and Credential Program, Faculty Director and Principal Investigator of the Bay Area Writers Project and a board member of the National Writing Project. He also was a board member of the American Educational Research Association from 2014 to 2017 and a board chair of REARM, middle and high school in Berkeley, uh, California from um, 2011 until 2017. Um, before earning his PhD at the University in Illinois in Chicago and uh, becoming a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, Professor Mahi was a credential high school te uh, English teacher um, in Chicago public schools for seven years. And we will now today hear um, uh, uh, about his new book, Deconstructing Race, Multicultural Education Beyond the Color Bind, which, um, uh, which was released last year. Um, he is also an editor for the first year of teaching classroom research to improve student learning and uh, what they don't learn in school, literacy in the lives of urban uh, youth. Additionally, um, he published a children's book entitled um, The Day They Stole a Letter. J. Dr. Mahari was guest editor also for uh, uh, two special issues of the Multicultural Educational Review um, on the theme of, and I quote, cyberlines, digital media, and multicultural education in 2017. Um, so I'm not going into details over his uh, wide published uh, uh, areas. Um, um, so you have to look that up because we're a little tight on time here. Um, the book, Deconstructing Race, Multicultural Education Beyond the Colorbine, um, is in this moment a very important contribution and, uh, to the struggle we are facing. In this moment of an unapologetic return to identity politics, mitigating the detrimental um, impacts of othering and increasing our sense of belonging are more important. This book argues that schooling in the, uh, in the United States and thus the role of educational uh, leaders is critical in, ch in challenging and changing problematic narratives in, in the US so society that perpetuates decisions, divisions, belong ethnographical interviews, uh, be, excuse me, beyond racial lines. Based on the conceptual framework of microcultures, which is uh, um, coined by Professor Mahi, that uh, draws from an analysis of ethnographical interviews with uh, informants who are socially defined within each of the five racial categories ascribed in the US census. The, this work illuminates how the idea of race is performed and perpetuated. Its ethnographical data and analysis juxtapose a color-coded pictocracy with the, lives of, uh, the lived realities of illegitimate skin. Ultimately, this book makes the case that the role of the education is imperative in, in understanding the complexities and contradictions of how the idea of race is enacted to increase mar marginalization and exclusion, and also, importantly, what educators can do about it. Professor Mahi's Deconstructing Race arrived at a pivotal time in American politic, politics and history and argues that historically under the um, hierarchies of white supremacy and privilege in the US, non-white people have been oppressed. He offers a theoretical and empirical basis of moving beyond the confines of race towards an acceptance of microcultures as a mechanism of deeper understanding of identity formations, knowledge build building, and inter and intra group in, uh, interactions. Professor Maria's advances of this concept of microcultures, or as he states in his books, the numerous components of position 
positioning, practices, choices, and pers perspectives that make up the unique identities of each individual as a replacement for the idea of race. And here, of course, we are in the middle of a um, very important discussion, not only in the US, but also uh, in the larger African diasporic uh, uh, discourse. And that's where we are looking very much forward today to hearing from you um, about your book and then later discussing that. Please help me to welcome Professor Maillet. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming out tonight at the end of the year, at the end of an evening. Uh, I've had a wonderful time here in Germany. It's my first time. I've traveled around a lot of places in the world, but <clears throat> I've never been able to get to Germany yet. And so I also want to call attention to uh, a new friend and colleague, Professor Viola Georgi, who was instrumental in connecting me to uh, this institute and also had uh, brought me to Hildesheim to uh, give a, many presentations there, but we uh, had good opportunities to talk to graduate students and others. And also uh, Bremen, uh, her colleague uh, Yasmin up in Bremen was welcoming me there and I was there a couple days ago to give a talk there. So this is the final talk uh, here in Germany and tomorrow I leave for Madrid to see my daughter who is uh, studying for her master's degree uh, at a University of Madrid. One of the things that you don't get to put into a resume or a CV is very important and I want to share it with you. When I was uh, coming out of high school, one of uh, eight children in my family, no one had gone to college. <clears throat> and so my first job was, in a, was, in a, uh, was a factory job and my parents thought I was set for life. I had this good factory job and that was their vision for me. But of course this was during the Vietnam War. And so after no, no more than a year, I was in, in, uh, drafted into the uh, army and spent three and a half years there, becoming a lieutenant and eventually also going to Vietnam. But when I came back, I felt that I needed to atone. Uh, I hadn't come from a political family. They were very conservative, they were very religious, and I had gotten politicized in Vietnam, actually, reading so many books uh, in times that you know we weren't out in the field and doing other things. And so I was a part of a, a number of movements uh, in rooms with people like Stokely Carmichael and Imamu Baraka and Milana Rankaringa and others, uh, Minister Farrakhan in Chicago that was a hotbed for uh, the black liberation struggle, the black art struggle, uh, anti-apartheid struggles, African Liberation Day movements, Kwanzaa, it goes on and on. And I say that only to say that having been intricately involved in those struggles, I was interested now, as I have you know, become uh, a professor and a researcher, returning to some of these issues that we struggled with then in terms of uh, black liberation movements, and we now have like the Black Lives Matter movement and things like that, from a more critical perspective of looking at not only the positive things that those movements helped us to see and do, but also to look at some of the areas that they had problems in terms of I would argue replicating some of the same aspects of the power structures that we were struggling against. And so Freire, who we've all read, <coughs> Paulo Freire, talks about that notion of sub-oppression, that when you don't have a real view of what liberation looks like, then you will often model on the very oppressive structures that, were, uh, <coughs> that you were working against. And as a consequence, you end up replicating, perpetuating some of the same kinds of issues and problems, even if it's in a different color face. I'm not really interested in being oppressed by other black people any more than being oppressed by white people. So the question is, how do we disrupt oppression? Disrupt, de deconstructing race then is predicated on this notion that even when we have <clears throat> struggled to defend the ways the different ethnic or racial or cultural groups have been marginalized, we still are problematically tied to the superstructure of racial divisions 
that white supremacy has created for us. So there's a way in which the deeper we dig into these categories, and I'm going to try to demonstrate this graphically, the more we actually perpetuate the ways that those racial divisions have historically come about, and it prevents us from getting at a more complex, a more nuanced, a more creative, and a more authentic understanding of who we actually are. This is not to say that there aren't <clears throat> groups that have affinities, that there aren't communities of practice, that there aren't religious and other ethnic uh, connections that people have, language, geography, all of these kinds of things. But in the United States, it's been essentialized, it's been minimalized to appear as if you could neatly fit into one of five or six boxes. So this book is attempting to uh, address that. <laughs> And it's ironic that we're here at the uh, Bold Institute because I began every presentation by saying these are not the most important issues we need to deal with. Uh, as a human race, considerations of climate change or nuclear proliferation or resource depletion or global poverty and population growth and many, many others actually are more, should have more priority than the struggles we're having around our differences. And yet, our very differences get in the way of us being able to work with, with, with these more crucial problems. <clears throat> so I want to try to make four points in today's presentation. The first is that uh, a critical 21st century problem is the color bind. And I'm going to come back and make it clear that I'm not talking about color blind. In fact, it's just the opposite. Secondly, <clears throat> It's a, this uh, color bind is a key driver of multiple processes of othering. And one of the things that we're struggling with, because I'm a member of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, and we have a number of clusters of researchers, and there's one cluster on race and, uh, and equity and inclusion, and I'm a part of that cluster. But we're looking for better terminology than race or ethnicity or the other ways that we want to identify groups. And a fundamental consideration is, how do we other others? What are those processes? And how do they play themselves out? Not necessarily just across the different divisional groups, but even internally within them. So issues of oppression, issues of othering can be just as par uh, uh, powerful in the black community, where you might have gender you know, considerations and gender domination and other kinds of things going on, age ish issues, uh, geography issues, social class issues. And so we're trying to struggle with othering as a better way of thinking about how we engage and understand these processes that go across the different groups as well as, you know, uh, between those groups. And the other side of othering, of course, is belonging. But the uh, third point that I'd like to make is, um, that, that this crucial issue uh, gets in the way of us dealing with the other global problems that we have uh, that need to have inclusive-oriented solutions. And finally, <clears throat> I want to make a case that ethnography is a key way of understanding uh, microcultural uh, positioning, which is necessary for us to get a better sense of inclusion and belonging. So I'm only going to read two sentences <laughs> from my book. But they're uh, the first two sentences. Actually, I'm going to read uh, about four. <laughs> but the first words in the book under the title of uh, Writing Wrongs, and I just put the um, table of contents so that you can see each of the places that the book is attempting to go. Um, maybe you want to think of it as a, uh, a sandwich of some kind with these issues of looking at the particular racial groups as they identified in the United States. Um, wrapped inside the uh, uh, context of some conceptual framing on the front end and some description and analysis and findings on the back end. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the first words in the book under this title, Writing Wrongs, because for me, this notion of ethnography is how do we write about the other? And I want to play with the double meaning of write as a W-R-I-G-H-W-R-I-T-E uh, and R-I-G-H-T, how do we right the wrongs of the societies in which we, in, in which we engage? And this <clears throat> person that was an influential uh, scholar for me in terms of ethnography, James Bradley, said, like, said it like this. Ethnography offers us 
the chance to step outside our narrow cultural backgrounds, to set aside our socially inherited ethnocentricism, if only for a brief period, and to apprehend the world from the viewpoint of other human beings. Another person who was influential was a person named Dale Himes, who was a social linguist. And we studied him because we were in a rhetoric language and a, a literacy a section of our English department. And of course, social linguists move away from linguistics by making the case that meaning is tied to context, right? So that we don't have some sort of arbitrary, independent, autonomous meaning for the signs that might exist to communicate meaning. It's all tied to context. Uh, I was talking to my colleague uh, this weekend, and she said something very uh, interesting to me, which was, I said that my book was predicated on just asking two questions. One is, how does society identify you? And the second one is, how do you identify yourself? So the interviews of the uh, 20 informants that I have in my uh, book were all predicated on just those two questions. And sometimes we would go for three hours in the interview. But my colleague, who is sitting here in the room, I want to identify her, said, for me, it depends on who's asking the question. And I thought that that was profound. I hadn't heard that before, the idea that the context matters, right? <laughs> and so I wanted to uh, just honor that idea. And then I'm going to move a little more quickly because I see myself getting bogged down in the excitement of like even the first chapter, and we haven't even gotten to uh, the other ones. But we'll talk about deconstructing race. We'll talk about the color bind. And I want to make an accent that is not colorblind <clears throat> from the standpoint of prisons and prisms of racial identity. And as I'm saying this, and you already know, this is an American analysis. I'm looking at it from the inside out of the United States. I'm not trying to make any claims for what's going on in Germany. I understand we have a lot of things that are similar, but we will get some illumination on that from my colleagues here, and we can add my uh, voice to those ideas as we have our, our discussion later. But the titles for the five chapters that looked at, in other words, I used the five colorized, essentialized categories that I am arguing are ascribed, created by white supremacy, for the titles of each of the chapters. But I use those colors from the standpoint of things that the informant said to me about how they dealt with the colors. And in one case, uh, a person who you will see, because she gave me the authorization to say, even though you interviewed me and even though you used a pseudonym, I'm quite comfortable with you showing my face and showing my words, because when you hear her words, it's important to see the face that that's coming out of. And she talked about how she, was, she felt that she was pretending to be white. Uh, an African-American woman who was the first person I interviewed, actually she was from the Caribbean, but she had come to the United States uh, at 15 and gone to Boston and felt that she was being discriminated against first and foremost by other black people. And that she had to learn to talk like, to uh, 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 dance like, to eat the food of, to listen to the music of, to dress like, to perform an African-American set of cultural behaviors in order to not be discriminated against by African Americans. And she talked about that as passing for black. One of my informants in the Asian group talked about nobody's yellow. And even though we sometimes embrace these colors, think about it. Uh, you know, we can talk about black and white, we can talk about brown folks, <clears throat> but nobody wants to use the term yellow, right? To describe a group of people. And if it doesn't work there, why should it work as well for the other groups. And I totally understand as a person who's involved in social linguists that you can take a term like queer and vacate that signifier from its original meaning and transform it so that you embrace that term and give it a different uh, motive, a different, a different force. Unfortunately, I think that we've done that with the N-word. Young people in the United States have done that with the N-word and that will be their argument. It's like, oh no, for this is a, a term of endearment. Okay, but do you know the history of how that term came to be? Red rum, if you spell it backwards, was used for the Native American group because if you spell it backwards, it means murder. And so one of the considerations, and where I learned the most in my research, was from interviewing people who were identified as Native American, because this is the group in the society that has been most marginalized, has effectively been the, uh, the, the victims of genocide. And as a consequence, 
The, or, the organization, the society doesn't want you to look at that. And so it puts the focus on other issues, the simple binary of a black-white dynamic, when it's the Native Americans who have lost their land and their languages, their culture, their religion, and their actual bodies. Uh, and so Red Rum was appropriate for that. So we can talk about microcultures and we can talk about uh, challenges of multicultural education because I tried at the very end of the book using work from my students in urban education classes over three years that the final project was to design learning experiences that attempted to facilitate teachers engaging young people in these acts of identity in ways that were much, much more complex and nuanced than the simple racial categories. And if there's time, I'll show you a couple of those uh, appendices that's at the end of the book. But the other piece that I want to read to you is this. It's the first words of the book that's not the epigram. Cuvier Jr. is caramel colored. He was three years old when this chapter was written. His family soon started calling him Santi, short for his middle name, Santiago. In the United States, where he was born, he is seen as a black boy, but his identity is much more complex than that. So I want to introduce you to uh, Santi because he was three years old at the time this book was being written. It's probably good that at three, he's getting comfortable riding electric cars. But Santi, the vignette goes on to show, is the son of an African-American father and a woman from Colombia. And that woman who's from Colombia would be called, <laughs> although we don't use that term, a migrant. She has a migrant background in the United States. She wasn't born there. But her mother is actually identified as white but white Colombian, so she was a part of a colonial presence in Colombia. And Santi is growing up bilingual. He's speaking uh, uh, Spanish and English. His father has had to learn Spanish to be a part of the family that he's in. But the irony of this young person being identified simply as a black boy when the tributaries that led to his existence the various lineages that come from Colombia and from Af uh, parts of uh, from Chicago, and, and I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit more about the, even the complication of that positionality is essentially the argument that I'm raising in this book in terms of a need for a greater sense of complexity and nuance and understanding the positionality of the people that we engage. So. The book is, stands on two legs. One leg is what I learned from the selected scholarship. And the other leg is what I learned from the lives of others. And I began in the scholarship with uh, W.B. Du Bois. Some of you know his work. Because he stated back in 1903 in his book, uh, The Souls of Black Folks, that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And so I wanted to play with that terminology a little bit and say the problem of the 21st century is the problem of the color line. So I'm making the case that we are so linked into these colorized categories that that is an, a, a critical problem of the 21st century. Du Bois was so interesting because he was the first um, African-American to graduate from Harvard University. He was a sociologist, and he was also an ethnographer. So he, when he talked about uh, the souls of black folks, he actually did research. He lived in a number of different communities around uh, the United States where he was and did in his research what he called lifting the veil. He wanted people to see who African Americans were behind the veil of stereotype and a sense of, you know, just trying to identify them consistent with an ideology that they did not take ownership of. And so we can also then talk about how do in the United States we lift the veil of white supremacy. The idea that our vision of the world and of ourselves and of each other is tinted by the veil through which we're having to view the realities into which uh, we engage. So Du Bois was very clear that 
uh, the color line has always been porous, impenetrable, that human passions and prerogatives and power have never been bound by ascribed racial categories, even when policed by unimaginable cruelties. So if you go back in the history, thinking about the, the 1900s in the United States, the 1800s in the United States, it's uh, a lot of problems that uh, are just unimaginable in terms of people enacting the most human considerations of engaging each other as human beings. I want to make it clear, though, <clears throat> that the colorblind is not colorblind. Rather than not seeing or denying difference, the colorblind challenges ongoing attempts to contain humans in right, racialized categories based on color-coded social-political constructions of difference. So I said that this uh, work was uh, tied to uh, what I learned from the uh, scholarship, from the literature, and we won't have time to really address any of these books, uh, but some of the works that were undergirding the way I was being helped to think about these issues, this first book that you see on your left, uh, stamped from the beginning, this brilliant young 34-year-old African-American person wrote this book that really showed how the history of the United States has been always tinged by the racial issues that we're struggling with today. In other words, rather than us after the Obama era getting to a point where you know, we can now be colorblind about race because I, we've in fact had a black president. He shows that the entire history of the country is contextualized by racist activities and anti-racist activities and he documents it through and through. It won the uh, National Book Award in the United States in uh, 2017. It was the first time a person that young, 34 years old, had won the National Book Award. I'm going to skip through some of the other books, but I want to call your attention to the one in the, in the middle, The History of White People by Nell Painter, because I'm going to come back to that. I want just us to be aware that these notions of who has migrant backgrounds in the United States applies to everybody. And the idea that some don't get tight with being able, except that there are prime times in the history when they were. And I'm going to try to end with a, a model actually from one of my doctoral students who did her dissertation on German immigrants in the 1920s in the United States. So we'll see if we can get that far. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. <clears throat> Even um, Toni Morrison in her, 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 her recent book on the uh, origin of, of others is a powerful treatment of this concept of othering and belonging. <clears throat> Uh, back in, but this is not new. In 1970, James Baldwin and Margaret Mead, the great anthropologists, had a rap on race. And all it was was they were sitting on a stage just like this. And there was an audience in front that could not even engage in the discussion. And they talked for seven hours on one day and seven hours on the next day, transcribed it, and put it into a book form. And it was the rap on race. But even then, Baldwin was challenging Margaret Mead and because he said, you know, really, whiteness is just an idea. And the great anthropologist could not accept that. And so part of what the argument is when we start looking at these issues in the United States is we're asking people who have identified themselves as white to recognize the history of how that idea came into existence and don't necessarily feel that you have to be allies to the struggle. You can, as, as W.B., uh, not as uh, Du Bois said, but as a Booker T. Washington said, drop down your buckets where you are. Struggle with the people that are around you who are, in, in, in many cases, if you are in power or you have privilege, these kinds of battles will ripple out to release the chains that are on people who have been pushed out to the margins. But it's so much easier to want to be an ally, to want to be a witness, uh, to want to be a, a, a person who supports the struggle when you are the struggle. You either accept your engagement in it or you move past it. I wish we had more time, but we don't, so you'll have to read the book. But I'd go into a really interesting, I think, uh, discussion of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. And one of the things I was uh, in talking to Anka uh, is that your institute is named after a, a scholar who was also a writer. You know, he, he, he dealt with fiction as well as essays and other kinds of things. And so I wanted to be able to incorporate the ideas, not just of the research scholars, but people who were amazing uh, literary scholars too. And if you read the prologue of The Invisible Man closely, you will see that there are elements of what 
I would call a deconstruction of race. He talks about being in a room of 1,333 lights. Uh, he's, he's, one of, he's living off the grid. He's sapping his energy from the uh, monopulated power company. Nobody knows that he's down in this basement, you know, cavern. And uh, he says that he's sipping on some, uh, some uh, slow gin and also taking a hit of reefer. And in this state, and, he's eating, and by the way, he's eating some vanilla ice cream. I can identify with that part of it. And he says, in this state, while he's listening to Louis Armstrong's, what did I do to be so black and blue? He's able to slip between the notes. This is a beautiful image for me, because he's talking about going down in the music. You know, uh, we talk about Fifty Shades of uh, Grey, right? The book that came out in the United States. Oh, uh, Gil Scott Heron talks about 100 shades of the blues. So we always make this analogy between black people and the blues. You know, I ain't got no money blues. I ain't got no woman blues, you know? But uh, think about 100 shades of the blues, that, that the diversity of even what we can consider the blues is almost infinite. And he's slipping into the blues and going down into the, uh, uh, the interstitial space between the notes, and he's encountering on the first level a woman, he says, who is screaming in a voice that sounded like his mother, who is the color of ivory, but she's on a slave auction. And so he's capturing this quote that Du Bois has said, that all of these notions of <clears throat> passions and prerogatives of humans, how did she get on a slave auction and how was she the color of ivory and how does he connect to her as if she was his mother? He's deconstructing the notion that she has to look exactly like him, that all of the kinds of things that brought this history of slavery and inter incest and other kinds of miscegenation considerations together and he doesn't even explicate it. He just like leaves you with that image and goes on. It's beautiful. The final image is one where he's listening to a black preacher uh, preaching on the topic of the blackness of blackness. And what he's doing is actually deconstructing blackness because the preacher is saying black will make you and it'll unmake you. Blackness is and it ain't. These ideas of these, kind, you know, these are conflicting positionalities of thinking about blackness, and we'll come back to this uh, with, an, with another thing from one of the museums, is essentially what in 19, in, um, 1947, <clears throat> when this book was written, Ralph Ellison is already playing with these complex you know, considerations that it's not as simple as we think it is. And this is another book, by the way, that won a National Book Award in 1951. Okay, so I thought this would be fun because this is not a, an attempt to pander to you guys, but when I talked about the idea of learning from the lives of others, in 2006, I saw this movie, The Lives of Others, and it was really profoundly impactful for me because it was like the best, it won the Oscar in 2006 for the best foreign film. But the idea of this person who was uh, a member of the Stasi and assigned to spy on these artists, and as a process of experiencing, even though it was serotypously, the lives of others, his own life began to change. And so I just want us to begin at that point of the ethnographic perspective, the ability to say, let's see the other from the perspective of the other, rather than bringing our vantage point and frame and overlaying it on other people and trying to say, whatever. Do you have a migrant background? That question should be turned around to you. Do you have a migrant background? Well, I don't want to go too far. <clears throat> so <laughs> I'm only on the third slide. <laughs> We're going to zoom through this. But I did want to uh, just say that the leader of our organization, the Haas uh, Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, one of his, bo his book was up there in the, in the group of books that I showed. He argues that the problem of othering is the problem of the 21st century. And in a world beset by seemingly intractable and overwhelming challenges, virtually every global, national, and regional conflict is wrapped within or organized around one or more dimensions of group difference. Othering undergirds territorial disputes, disputes sectarian violence, military conflict, and the uh, spread of disease, hunger and food insecurity, and even climate change. These are like really bold claims for just the concept of othering, right? And we don't have time to unpack all of these claims. But I did think that the argument that I'm making that our struggles with 
uh, trying to uh, be an inclusive society or marginalizing some people in our society definitely gets in the way of us addressing some of the bigger problems that we face as a human society. So the opposite of othering is belonging. And I want to tell this story, and I'm going to be mindful of the time, uh, in, a, in, a, in a series of twins. I want to talk to you about three sets of twins. And if there's time, I want to talk to you about three museum experiences. <clears throat> But one of the people I interviewed was a person I gave the uh, pseudonym of Felix. And he had been at a uh, lecture by Paulo Freire at uh, Harvard. <clears throat> and he said, Fre Freire talked about his experiences as an exile, about in-betweenness, about belonging and not belonging, about our human condition to nature, to water, to feeling the air and ocean. Uh, Felix had spent the previous summer wading in the ocean of the, uh, that connects 7,641 Philippine islands. So he was Filipino himself. And when we start talking about Asian people, even if we just went to that one co uh, 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 country that's defined as an Asian country, although some people argue it's really more a Spanish-influenced colonial country than Asian, but we don't have time to uh, unpack that yet, which one of the Asian cultures which you'll be talking about of 7,000 islands and 147 different languages just in the Philippines alone. But he felt alone on this island as if he was on an island of his own because his multiple identities as a Filipino American, as a gay uh, a person, made him feel he didn't belong. For Felix, uh, for Felix Freire's lecture was an affirming humanity and affirming his belonging as a human being. <clears throat> So the interesting thing is that Felix has a twin brother, an identical twin brother, who is married and has kids and has a completely different life than the one that Felix is leading. Uh, even though obviously they, they grew up together for the first 18 years, probably almost under simultaneous, uh, uh, very similar social conditions. <clears throat> so I want to uh, highlight this notion of how twins are one uh, window into the problem of trying to identify anyone along uh, essentialized categorizations of who that person might be. So this was the cover of uh, National Geographic in uh, April of 2018. And it talks about uh, these twin sisters make us rethink everything we know about race. And so we know that race is a, not a, a scientific fact, but it is a social fact. So the first museum experience that I wanted to talk about <clears throat> had to do with, in about 2006 also, same, around the same time that um, I'm looking at the lives of others, there was a really interesting um, set of uh, ex exhibits at a museum in San, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And what it talked about was the three different ways of thinking about these issues of the idea of race. It talked about it from the standpoint of the science of human variation, which dis dismantles any notion that there's a, a scientific justification for the idea of race. But it does talk about the history of race and the everyday experience of race. And one of the things that I think that we're attempting to do in the United States is <clears throat> transform our experiences of race so that we positively change the history of race to be consistent with what we know to be the science of the idea of race. Race, you know, um, Peggy talked about my notion of illegible skin. We really can't put people into the categories that we've been asked to fit them into. And sometimes I've used this picture which was sent to me as a flyer in the mail to just say in the, of, of the audience, tell me which one of the five categories in the United States you think this woman fits into. And invariably, I get 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%. People are not able to tell whether she's Native American, Asian, uh, white, or maybe mixed African American, or Latina, or Latino. And so the flyer was this, where it was something advertising the Latino Film Festival, but even I'm just as unable because when I, I was, had the opportunity to give two talks back to back. One was at uh, the University of Texas, Austin, and the other was at Texas State. They're about you know, 40 miles apart. You guys would say kilometers. Uh, <laughs> so 60 kilometers away. And uh, on, the, on your left, I thought that uh, Minda Lopez, at Texas State was a Latino woman. 
until I got to know her. And it turns out she's, she identifies herself as, she is a white woman, but she had just happened to marry a Latino man, but she was also completely fluent in Spanish. Whereas at U University of Texas, Austin, I thought Christina was a white woman, and she spent the whole trip driving me to the other university talking about how uh, proud she was to be a Latina and that she had come from a town in Texas that was all Latina, that many of them had been able to go to the University of Texas. So both of my initial perceptions were completely off. So I'm just going to let you listen okay. to her for a second. Hi, I'm Jessica Strick. I'm an exhibit developer at the Exploratorium. So I've been having the opportunity in another uh, museum, the Exploratorium, which is uh, in the um, of San Francisco Bay Area, and it's a very interactive museum. And I'm working with her because uh, one of my former graduate students is literally her boss, uh, who is the director of uh, teaching and learning for the museum. And she's creating this installation on unraveling race, which is very close to the notion of deconstructing race. But she's using these threads and allowing people to interact, starting with the basic categories, but then all of these other touch points along the way to more uniquely capture what their identity is. OK, so I'm going to move a little more quickly. These are some great pictures, but we don't have time to talk about them. But this is a picture I cannot, I cannot pass. This is our most recent election in the United States, just a month ago. Uh, these are our new Republican members of Congress. You don't need to have a map of the United States to get the sense of what this um, set of pictures is representing. And of course, um, George Lakoff talked about this notion that if you're trying to understand the mindset of people who are conservative in the country, he, he, he cast two frames. One was the uh, strict father frame, that people believe that security, that the way the world should work, that the hierarchies that we should exist is like a, a family with a strict father at the head. And the alternative frame is one of the nurturing parent. And so I'm going to show you a picture of the uh, new Democrats who were elected to office. But we can see here that of the um, uh, members who were elected, only one was a woman. Everyone else in the Republican Party was a white male. And some cartoonists raised this question that white women who enjoy proximal power from their association with white men have often served as white pat patriarchy's most eager foot soldiers. Here's the Democratic Party. And you can see, you know, much more diversity. In fact, 25 uh, women and 15 men were elected. And just this idea that in the Republican Party, it's gone up from 86% to 90% with the last election, whereas in the Democratic Party, it's gone down from 41% uh, white males to 38%. So the idea of, you know, working for diversity however you might de define it, this is much more representative, much more reflective of the country itself. And this is where we're locked into struggle right now between those who are still believing that America reflects and means a certain set of images and structures and languages, and those who are saying, no, America is wonderfully diverse. OK, I'm going to bring things to a close, but I would uh, just encourage you to read the book and, talk, and see the ways that these positionalities are institutionalized in major institutions in the society, like the census. For example, in um, 1790, the very first census, all the way to 2010, which doesn't even go as far on this chart, the term white stayed exactly the same, whereas every other group, and you will see lines if you go to the, uh, to, to the website, uh, of the Census Bureau for every other group. Some people coming into the country at different times, Chinese coming in and going out for 100 years and coming back, Mexicans being defined as white in 1926 and then not so. Uh, and yet, African Americans were always the struggle to try to, how, how do we define this group that we are defining as the other? And it's always variable. So I'm old enough to uh, have uh, recognized that my dad's birth certificate identified him as a colored man. My birth certificate says Negro. My younger brother, who's 20 years younger than me, his birth certificate says Afro-American. It wasn't African-American even at that point. So we're 
two generations in the same family, but the sense, of, excuse me, the, uh, the, the, the birth certificate is defining us in these very different ways where if I happen to have been white, that name on the birth certificate, that identification is gonna be the same whether 1790 or 2010. All right, we love to play with Derrida. I love to, uh, you know, just no, raise this notion, mainly to just problematize it with some of my black brothers and sisters by raising the argument that whiteness created blackness. I'm almost just gonna like leave you guys with that because, um, but it's true that in order for whiteness to have its sense of itself, which is tied to a notion of purity, it had to create its oppositional you know, contrast. And so part of the problem of investing only in a, in a sense of blackness as it's defined in our, in our society in the United States is that its original origins come from the creation. We can go back to 1620s, and I can, in the book, I try to I, I talk about that. Okay, last slide. Next to the last slide. Okay, uh, I feel like then that what we've been placed in is prisons, prisons of racial identity, and I tried to uh, capture that by putting an almost unidentifiable figure in a box to indicate that prism, excuse me, prison, but then I was thinking, oh, well, prisms would be much more uh, liberating, you know, all of the diverse colors. And when I thought about how a prism works, P-R-I-S-M, it's still white light that's refracted to create the, the, the array of colors. And these are not all the colors that we could possibly see. So the notion then that the color categories that we're operating in are all predicated on whiteness, and whether it's a black-white binary, or whether it's a white and the other, binary, white and people of color binary is still a binary that Derrida says never exists without hierarchy also being a part of it. And that's what, if I had a magic wand and I could wave it, I would say, let's flatten hierarchy. Okay, so let me get to the end. It would be interesting to play with this, but let's could talk about Rachel Dolezal and her pretending to be black. Uh, but if she's pretending to be black and blackness itself is a lie and she's lying about a lie, what does that mean? Let me just let you listen for two seconds to her talking about pretending to be white and then we'll close. Okay, so passing just sounds like something less active, like something that happens. Like I pass as mm -hmm. a white American because of how I look. Mm -hmm. But if I'm pretending, yeah. right, like I have a role in it. So I think to some extent, any immigrant who is assimilating into a culture is pretending. I think my entire childhood, I was probably pretending to be an, like a, a person born in the United States. So, so the question would be, who has to pretend and who doesn't? So the last museum was so interesting because we have the new African American History Museum in, in Washington, D.C. Just opened about two years ago. You have to stand in line for two hours to get in, and then you, they give you a time, come back at two o'clock, which I did. And on the bottom floor, they, they go from slavery up. But it was so interesting that Elaine Locke in 1925, one of the Harlem Renaissance people, was talking about how, again, this thing that we call race or Negro life is just a defensive position that we're trying to make the best out of. If you've been given lemons, maybe you can make some lemonade. But what I thought was so phenomenal, and Du Bois did this also in 1900 in the, in the World's Fair in, um, in, in, in France. He put the whole uh, representation of the small nation of people, uh, African Americans, in photographic form. And almost many of the images were people who were racially indistinguishable. I'll say this in terms of these women looking racially indistinguishable because my mother fits in with them. My mother, who I just put the picture up of, is a Cherokee Indian. So even if you were trying to identify me as a black man, you're cutting off 50% of the lineage that I came with. We went down south, this was my grandmother and my great-grandmother. Cherokee Indians with hair that was as long as you could imagine. So here, I, I promise, I'm gonna close here. Because I like this last slide, and I'm going to get some audience participation as we close. So my daughter sent me a picture, <clears throat> and she said, uh, Dad, I just wanted to see this picture of me and my roommates. We're hanging out. And I said, what do you mean, what do you mean hanging out? I mean, you guys are talking to each other. She said, oh, yeah, we're, we're agreeing to be 
uh, alone together. So I want you, and we'll close here, to just by a show of hands, and this is the last shot at saying, uh, ir ir you know, illegible skin. See if you can tell me which one of these women is my daughter. So if you think the woman on the left is my daughter, raise your hand. Just raise your hand. On the left, on your left. Okay, did I see the hands? Okay, I see. Okay. If you think the woman in the middle is my daughter, raise your hand. All right, about a third. If you think the woman on the right is my daughter, raise your hand. Okay, this is the first audience that's really had more people that's got her right. <laughs> Nia is my daughter. Her friend next to her is, is Indian. Her friend next to her is Latina. But, and I'll, I'll close with this shot, just because we want to stereotype people into these racial categories, it just so happens that Nia is an amazing, uh, she, she's really gifted in math and science. So I said, Nia, what do people think you are down there? It's only 3% African Americans on your campus at, at UC Santa Barbara. She said, Dad, people think I'm uh, Indian because I'm so good at math and science. They cannot imagine her <laughs> being African American and good at math and science at the same time. And just to sort of close and say thank you all for all your uh, uh, time at listening to this, Nia has a twin sister who I'm going to see tomorrow in Madrid who looks Latina. And so when I'm with her, responses to me are very different than when I'm with Nia because, oh, there's dad is with this nice, you know, little daughter. And, this. and with Ayana, it's like, what is this old guy doing with this young woman? So these are the contradictions. These are the problems that we're struggling with. We won't have time to go much further, but we can maybe pick up some of this in our discussion. Thank you guys so much for your attention and your... Thank you so much, Professor Mayi. Um, well, uh, you walked us through the book, and I'm sure we really need to start to read that all starting tonight, so try to get your copy. <laughs> um, Yes, and uh, you already um, also mentioned it. Uh, the book was researched um, at the time of the 2016 um, election campaign, and uh, you were writing it up um, in this first year of what we are now experiencing with um, individual one in the uh, Oval Office. And you already referred um, to the necessity of that here. Well, um, we want to talk about um, your concept of uh, microcultural um, identities, as you describe it also in the book and showed us in examples of the complexity but also the fluidity of it um, and what it means to deconstruct racist marking in order to lower institutional uh, racism in schools. Uh, we want to also talk about the similarities and differences in the educational systems of the US and Germany. So from what you uh, uh, laid us out for t for, uh, now, um, what can we do with that or what it means also for us here in Germany? So for that, we have another very distinguished guest, um, and it is my profound uh, uh, honor uh, to introduce uh, her to you. Uh, professor Dr. Maisha Auma is a professor for childhood and uh, um, difference uh, at the uh, Magdeburg Stendal University of Applied Science, but also a visiting professor for gender diversity studies and education studies at the Humboldt University in Berlin. As a member of of Adefra, a queer feminist um, NGO of and for black women in Germany uh, since 1993, she is also an activist using her experiences and platform to educate and sanitize on matters of um, affecting BPOC black POC experiences um, in society. 
Born in Kusumu, Professor Auma's earliest uh, memories can be traced to her home within the staff quarters of McGarthy uh, Road Primary School, where her mother um, worked as a teacher at the time. And I quote from an interview she gave um, two years ago um, when she said, and I quote, uh, teaching was a very central in uh, the family. Um, her desire to become a teacher came from her admin admiration of her mother, one of the best swimming coaches of Kenya, um, what Kenya ever had, and uh, her uncle, a former vice uh, VC of the University of Nairobi. And I quote again, I grew up hearing people calling my mother Japunj, Luo for teacher, um, and it instilled in me a passion to teach. Um, she explained later and also in this uh, um, interview. I find that very fascinating. Despite her excellent academic record and the admission letter she received, Professor Auma had to go to the Studienkolleg, which we know very well, to attain uh, the required 13 years of the then pre-university schooling in Germany. She qualified and got an admission to the Christian Albrechts Universität in Kiel, where she graduated in 1995 with a degree in social work. It was during her time working as a counselor, working with women and girls that had experienced violence and her own, um, and her own encounters with racism that forced her to become an activist to advocate for social coherence, coercions and against racism. And I quote again, I was forced to take self-defense courses to counter possible harassments. She spent many years in social work and negotiating space of women in society and realized uh, that gender issues and the position of women in the society leaned more on concepts from the West and remaining limited in the understanding of the challenges women in post-colonial society face. To Professor Auma, these challenges can be tackled if people co came collectively into position of consciousness where racial dif differences are not seen in an inhibiting um, social factor, but a diverse embodiment and unique personal and cultural attributes. With an interest to understand how children experience the social world and complex social problems like racism, Professor Auma would graduate with a doctoral de uh, degree after a successful uh, completion of her doctoral thesis and, um, titled How Children Understand the Construction of Social World. And uh, among her research foci, uh, where she published numerously, um, are diversity, inequality, and plurality in textbooks and uh, didactical materials in East and West Germany, um, sexual education as an empowerment for black communities and communities of color, critical whiteness, intersectionality, and critical race theory. Please help me also to welcome Professor Maisha Aoma. Peggy, thank you so much. It's it's quite a vulnerable process listening to my. Is this microphone on? It's on. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a weird process to listen to my biography and my subjectification <laughs> being put together like that. Um, I was raised by a single mom, and and that's obviously is a is a situation in society. A young single mom. And uh, she was at the same time a teacher, so it was kind of like on one side a marginalized perspective, but on the other side, um, the protection of 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 the, the the validation of teachers was obviously central to my biography. So thank you for that. Um, it's such a pleasure to sit here with you, Professor Mahiri, uh, with you, Peggy uh, McCon. Thank you so much for organizing this. Um, uh, I'm so glad that you, you made it here. After all these lectures, you must be exhausted. You're almost losing your voice. Uh, we are extremely grateful <laughs> that you found time before you go off on, on the break, uh, the holiday break, to see your daughter in Madrid and, and, and probably the rest of your family, um, that you took time, time out of your schedule to come here. We're very excited to be able to engage with your conceptualization and, and with your work, with the body of work that's in this one book. Uh, it's extensive what you've done. Obviously, I want to read the children's book. I work on children and different, so I definitely want, need to read the children's book as well. I have a couple of observations. I was not asked to give a commentary, but I wish I had been asked to give a commentary. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> so so I'm, I'm just going to start off with a couple of observations. And then I have six questions, and I guess Peggy's going to allow me to ask three. So I, I, I think if, if, if I make it through three, it's a good thing. So you have to come back so I can ask my other three questions, right? I'm not going to anger Peggy. I want to be invited back, so... I'm definitely going, not going to anger Peggy. So a couple of observations. What I really like about your conceptualization is um, I, I come from the background, obviously, from we, we share a background in education, um, in dealing with marginalization and uh, with the realities of dehumanization that also happen within the context of learning and uh, of administration of, of education. And... Um, I'm, I'm sensing that we are also here in a, in a common struggle for intersectional justice, trying to, uh, that, that's, that's what your work, how your work is uh, resonating with me. It's very relatable on the sense, sense of the struggle for intersectional justice. So having said that, the thing I like most about your work that I think is really fascinating is that you're thinking subjectivities from the bottom up. Uh, I'm, I'm going to. It's, it's, uh, I can't find a term to to uh, say it better than than, than that. So um, I'm, I'm going to try and get to the point of what I'm trying to say. If you're looking at at the multiple and contradictory influences that impact who we become, form who we become, um, versus on the other side categories that, that are assigned and that we then have to in relation to the subjectify us in a, in a very violent way. But at the same time, we, we draw on different influences that happen on us, that we look for intentionally. Um, um, and, and those are those multiple influences that, that uh, you call nuanced and complex on one side. And uh, the question of, of, of uh, taking account the subjectivity of people in education is very central to the kind of work we're doing. Subjektorientierung, subjektwissenschaftliche Bildung. But it's very, it's very central to the kind of work that we're doing in a sense of liberatory practice in education, so I really like that part. And um, I like the fluidity of your concept, and it reminds me very much, uh, I'm going to ask you later how you come to this deconstruction, but it reminds me very much of uh, uh, queer and gender studies and the question of, of challenging the binary which you're doing the whole time that always says we have categories that are assigned, and then we have expressions, and then we have a whole way of, 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 of finding stuff, I'm going to say, uh, uh, digital culture, social media, uh, Instagram, but black Twitter, all of this stuff that, that, that uh, um, helps us negotiate the spaces in which we find ourselves thrust into. So um, that reminds me very much of that and I like the fluidity of it and, and I've missed this fluidity very much in critical race work or work that, that's, that, that's trying to work uh, uh, with, with, with race um, uh, relations. Um, that you had Toni Morrison in your slides made perfect sense because she's the other uh, uh, um, black theorist that, that's deconstructing. Now I know your work and she's the other person I think of in the field of literature and cultural studies. So um, this radical black deconstructing force is, uh, it's mind blowing. And um, where I'd like to, to stop is, is uh, um, you, you spoke very much towards the end about um, deconstructing a notion, deconstructing the, the notion of race. And I like the messiness and the humanity of this project. Um, it's definitely messy. Deconstruction comes with messiness. And I like that you're emphasizing a sense of commonality and, and, and affirming humanity and belonging as a human being. And I like that because we desperately need it in education to, to affirm the uh, uh, humanity of the subjects, the, the plural subjects who sit in front of us and come with various wounds. And um, to close that, I also like very much that, that you, you brought in uh, the perspective of Native Americans, First Nations people. It makes sense because it's also part of your heritage, um, but not only because of that. It's not a part of my heritage, but I'm very, very sympathetic with with um, looking at the dispossession and disenfranchisement that First Nations people, especially now in the administration in which we are in the era of Trumpism, to look at uh, just the brazenness of it and this and the whole debates surrounding it and uh, um, arguing with this concept of nativism, where I've always said you're not natives, you're all migrants, we are all migrants, we were forced to migrate, but it's White people are also all migrants in the North American context. So settler racism is also something that we need to take into account when we look at uh, um, the whole conceptualization of, of racism. So that's my observations. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm coming to my first question. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to check in with you every time. And if I make three questions, we're good. If I don't, I'm probably going to just trip up Professor Mahiri on the way outside and, and, and ask my third question anyway. <laughs>
<laughs> so yeah, I'm definitely going to do that. So uh, my first question is this one. It's, it's actually, it's a question, but it's also a worry. How can we, how far can we deconstruct race um, when at the same time race and racism is alive and tweeting in the White House? There seems to me to be a risk. Um, um, I, I definitely want to deconstruct race, but I, I'm not sure how far I'm able to go, um, seeing as we're not in a post-racial society. We were, we were promised a post, uh, um, um, post many things. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a post twist in my head, but we had declared a post something that we are not in. Uh, uh, we are not there yet. And yesterday, uh, from this administration, we also heard that that the people at the southwestern border in San Diego and 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 the other uh, uh, parts coming from Mexico are carrying communicable diseases or contagious diseases, which I, which I think is one of the most dehumanizing things to say after all the craziness with the Middle Easterners. And uh, never mind, we're going to celebrate Christmas where we're talking about Middle Easterners, uh, 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 whom we apparently worship, many of us, who are from monotheistic religions. So my question is, how far can we deconstruct race according to your conceptualization, mm -hmm. taking into account all the things? God bless the child who has his own. <laughs> That's a great question. And um, I want to begin by going back to something you said about Toni Morrison, which um, I had the opportunity when I was this young, you know, radical person. And we had all these institutions and publishing companies and things like that. And uh, the person who was in charge of our organization was a famous... Um, writer in the black arts movement. His name was Donnell Lee, and he had a lot of black uh, books, you know, books that he had written that were helping to move the thing. And he set up a meeting with me and uh, Toni Morrison when she was an editor at Random House. And uh, what was so interesting, when I'm like a 25 or 26-year-old kid, and I'm in the room with the great woman before she's become a Nobel Prize laureate. And, and um, ostensibly, I was supposed to be there to uh, get a better sense of how the publishing industry worked, because we had our own little black publishing company, Third World Press. Instead, she took me on a tour of what she felt was her role in this predominantly white institution in terms of contributing to the narrative and helping to transform it. And she talked about it from the standpoint of a book that came her way that was a very nice book on the history of the United States from the standpoint of how trains played a role. And so she pushed back with the author by saying, you know, this is a great book and we want to publish it, but you haven't done justice to uh, describing and researching how trains have been central to the black experience in the United States also. So the author uh, wanted to propose back okay, I'll put another chapter in on blacks and trains. And it was just like the caboose, you know, on the, on the train, a separate category to look at that. And she said, no, that won't work. If you want to get published at Random House under my editorship, you have to interweave the experience of African Americans throughout every chapter of the book in terms of uh, the, the, the roles that trains have played with them along with all of the other people that you're critiquing. And so for me... It was eye-opening that how do we get beyond just the category that we've been placed in? She's given us a metaphor that we're all on a train together and that um, there may be differential positioning in terms of how you came to the train, but if it's a human endeavor, and one of the issues that um, is just a little bit problematic for me in terms of intersectionality is that it wants to look at the ways that we are different in, in, in terms of different elements of how we are oppressed. And so it then mires us in our sense of how we look from the inside out from an oppressive lens. And so one of the things that I think I'm attempting to do with deconstructing race is, is say, how do we begin with the sense and this is where you, you, you made the very interesting point of trying to go from the inside out, the sense of being a human and coming into existence in the way that you have with all of the, do you know, to use another metaphor, the tributaries that lead into the stream of your humanity that may be flowing into an, a, a larger ocean that we're all involved in. And I think that um, 
when I was up at, 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 at uh, the University of Bremen, I tried to uh, characterize it this way. Certainly, I mean, for, for one, it's inaccurate, okay? So if I want to be able to embrace the totality of who I am, why do I have to lop off the part of me that comes from another, you know, uh, uh, culture, in this case, uh, Cherokee Indian? And so there's a, a, a element to resist the simple categories of race, and at the very least to complicate it so that we have a much better understanding of its complexity and nuance. But I think there's something more than that. And in the book, I talk about all of the different kinds of identities. For example, there were 21 categories when I did all of the um, uh, patterning, you know, the coding of the data. And then I reduced it to 13 categories. And then I tried to put those 13 into three major categories. And so the first one had to do with hyperdiversity. Everybody is hyperdiverse. So one of the things that people who want to identify under the simple term of whiteness need to also understand is the hyperdiversity that, that they are representing in terms of issues of migration. And if we'd had time in the, in the lecture, I would have gone through case by case, the Irish, the Polish, the, the Germans, you know, the uh, Italians, and even the Jews were not white when they came to the country. They were migrants. And the, the uh, work that my uh, student did showed the struggles that in the Germans in Midwestern United States struggled to have to give up their language and other kind of things to assimilate to be a part of America. Now, again, there was something else going on also, but it was problematic. So uh, to, to try to um, put a cap on the, uh, the, the response to your very provocative question, I want to return to the conversation that I was having uh, at Bremen a couple days ago. And the, Yasmin, who you may know, is uh, this really interesting professor, and she's been the vice president of the university. You know her? Yeah, OK. OK, so this is so you guys know her. Maybe you guys don't, but you know how she looks. So I made the case that um, James G., one of the uh, researchers, talks about activity-based identities, that in addition to uh, all of the other ways that we may identify, that we can also look at how we engage in activities and ways that that gives us a sense of identity. So for me, 90% of my day is engaged in activities that's tied to being a professor. I'm not saying that that's my only identity, but about 90% of my day, I'm reading articles, I'm grading papers, I'm preparing for lectures, I'm uh, communicating on email and other kinds of things. At that level, so I talk about identity contingencies, the physical ways that we are, are, are placed in the world, and we can reach Claude Steele to get a real ins uh, insight into how identity contingencies can be the basis for a stereotyping and other kinds of things. But we also have identity affinities, and particularly, and you mentioned some of these things with the internet and other kinds of things, we're not linked to the physical space in which we exist, and the affinity groups that we can form where we have projective identities and virtual identities. And some people, young people have told me that they feel they're more real on Facebook than they are in the real world. So this is the complexity that, 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 that I think we're working with. And so what I was suggesting to Yasmin is that, you know, you and I probably have much more in common in terms of our identity, just on the activity-based identity, because you're doing the same things for 90% of your day that I'm doing, whereas I have a brother who's two years older than me that after five minutes of conversation on the phone, we have nothing else to talk about. Now, I love my brother, and he's like, uh, he, had gone, he did not get a college education. He became a contractor. He can build a house from the ground up. He can do the electrical work, the carpentry work. The, he can lay the foundation. Um, he can do the plumbing. So if there comes an apocalyptic time, he's going to be the one voted on the island, not me, because... I work with words every day, and Yasmin works with words every day, but in terms of activity-based identities, we have these affinities that, that, that are not tied to the contingencies that we happen to exist. And what I'm trying to say is, how do we open ourselves, how do we liberate ourselves to be able to intersect and interact with the various affinities that we have as we grow through life, wherever those other people may be coming from, and we create affinity groups. We create you know, uh, communities of practice uh, where I feel just as much at home uh, talking to her about her travails, even though they're different from mine because we have so much in common. I'll, I'll, I'll just stop there. I didn't quite get to all of your questions, but we'll pick it up at the dinner. <laughs> yeah, uh, just to, to get in for a, for a second. Um, 
This is a very easy job for me. I, I actually only can, can sit here and don't have to moderate so much. No? Yes, I do. I, I also have uh, questions, but um, but but please, uh, uh, Maisha, I would suggest you know if you can uh, take two of your questions together and then we go in an, uh, in a third round, and I will only take two questions that we also can get and uh, open the discussion to the and audience. I'll, I'll try to make sure the answers too. Peggy, that's a risk asking me to put two questions together, but I can try. So. Um, what I'd like to know, one of our discussions, and, and, and now I'm, I'm opening up uh, uh, the question of, of whether we call the kind of intersectional justice, social justice we're trying to uh, um, move towards to give students uh, um, uh, the chance to, to live complex subjectivities and make meaning and therefore also have more relevant experiences in education. Um, we have this whole thing going on about calling this, this kind of education multicultural education, which you're calling it, or calling it diversity education. And um, from the specific context in Germany, um, we have a specific we have a specific race project um, that denies race, denies the existence of race. It's tending towards a kind of exceptionalism that that separates the the, the groups that are, that are racially dehumanized from each other. So we're separated from the Sinti and Roma as people of African de uh, uh, heritage. We're separated from people with a, a Jewish background, um, uh, from the uh, different groups because there's this thing that says uh, um, there's no racism actually, and we were bare colonial people, never mind that the uh, um, scramble and partition of Africa took place right here in Berlin. So um, what I'm trying to get at is, is two aspects. One aspect is we get uncomfortable as, as, as people who try to, to work against racialized hierarchies when we hear culture in Germany, because culture is used in old Europe and uh, obviously old Europe is also kind of dying. It's a system in crisis, it's taking a long time to die, but there's a new Europe on the horizon as well. So uh, we have the same thing going on in the, in, the, in the North American context in the US where there's an old order of the WASP ruling class that's kind of making way for a new order, but it's taking things with it. I have no idea. We have no idea if anyone will survive it. We might end up in dystopia. That's Peggy's. <laughs> Dystopian fantasies are Peggy's thing. So um, long-winded uh, thing. I'm trying to ask about how do we, how can we reconcile this thing about um, not focusing, over-focusing culture because we try, we have an allergy. If any of us who's, who tries to deal with hierarchies and tries to make, make an argument uh, 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 to make barriers visible and hierarchies, we try to avoid culture because culture usually means in old Europe that there's a hierarchy in culture and that our culture is deficient. And by, uh, by ours, I mean anyone who's racially marked. And, um, and there's, a, there's more comfort speaking about ethnicity because ethnicity, ethnicity seems to be evident, something that's really there, that just happens, that you can't question, that has nothing to do with power relations and with a binary. So that's, that's the one, one thing I was going to ask. Peggy, you asked for this. And, um, and we also need the groupness to uh, um, um, the, uh, for affirmative action, so what happens to affirmative action, and also for certain forms of empowerment, uh, like in recruitment, uh, affirmative action is probably enough. So that, that, that's what I'm asking about. I, I, I hear from your work that you're very much on, on, on the micro level uh, uh, of, of dealing with subjectivities and fluidity and everything, but at the same time, we have administrative stuff to do. <laughs> and on the administrative level, we have, I, I, I can't really, how am I going to sift through microcultures to argue that there's an underrepresentation of a certain group. So I'm, I'm concerned with the culture and ethnicity, and I'm concerned with empowerment. Great questions, great questions. <clears throat> so the microcultural analysis is almost like trying to get down to the uh, you know, molecular level of how we exist as a way of then building out you know, the continuing layers of complexity that emerge from those, you know, those, those uh, origins, those, those, this is for Toni Morrison's book, you know, the origins of others. So I'll answer your question in two ways. First, um, I think that we have to widen our circle of what some people call the circle of compassion or the circle of concern. Because the question of who gets in the group, whatever the group is, and who is on the outside of that group is itself a very political uh, conversation. Because it's, you know, making, you know, it, because even the people who are, are, are most marginalized, for example, 
have to recognize that the widening of the circle of, of, of uh, who gets in, in, involved in the groups is a part of what the struggle is. Mm -hmm. So when I look out in the audience today, I see you know, people who are coming from all kinds of backgrounds and perspectives. I don't know who the most revolutionary person is in terms of the work that they're doing, but it's clear to me that everybody has a role to play and that there are alliances and allegiances and affinities that we need to be seeking that are not obscure because we first want to protect the group because the first problem is that the group is continually transitory in terms of who those people who are getting defined inside the group. And even in you know, the black group in the United States, I mean, there's so many different quote unquote black groups. So I told you I was in the struggle in the 70s and 80s for you know, 20 years that's working. That was my full time job. And we had a whole bunch of us and we had you know, food co-ops and we lived cooperatively and we all married each other in the organization, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> it was interesting. <clears throat> but 35 years later, I came back in contact with one of the people in the group who was a woman who had been very successful. She, we, we both worked together on the, on the uh, journal that I uh, was the editor for, which was called Black Books Bulletin. And there was a kind of hint that we might have, in another lifetime, if she wasn't married and if I wasn't married, something might have happened. And now, 35 years later, I'm not married and she's not married, and she's a judge and I'm a, you know, a professor, and so why not? But, the, but she had stayed in that black perspective that we had so uh, back then, and she had not emerged. So her sense of the group was more and more, as we got to re-know each other, not including me. Because her sense of the group was like, a, a, it, was, it was mirroring the same concept that whiteness uses to say there's a kind of purity at the center of blackness. And then you get degrees away from that by your behavior, by your values, by your actions, et cetera. But some of these were micro actions, like we were going to a restaurant and I said, you know, there's a, one of my favorite restaurants over there is sushi. We can go and stop there. Oh, you eat sushi, my brother? So I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and we traveled on another and she was like, you know, you really need to put a little more bass in your radio. And so I'm like, how far down the line can you go to define yourself in terms of, I mean, in other words, I was not black enough. And, uh, and she's like a very intelligent person, very beautiful woman. She had become, she was a lawyer, she'd become a judge. But in effect, the judge was just a little bit too judgmental. And the point is this, that what, how do we expand the conception of what are appropriate behaviors on real things, you know, real values, and, 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 and that we get guilty when we go in to bury ourselves in the group, particularly when the group has already been constructed as a marginal group. So we're out on the margins, and we're now reifying the margins and saying, like, this is, you know, where it is, as opposed to people who are in the center, people who have power, people who have privilege, rather than trying to say we should get people from the margins to move to the center, what about the center moving more toward the margins to, 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 to um, minimize the hierarchies that exist in between? And they have the power and the privilege to do it. So I'll just end with this real, real quick point, which is every chapter started with a, um, with, with a provocative situation that was going on in the United States, racial dole is all passing for black. Uh, for the Native Americans, I used the Standing Rock situation because I thought that that was phenomenal. Standing Rock was where uh, the Native Americans were attempting to resist the pipeline that was coming through. And when you looked at the people, I really wish I had been able to go up there from my older, you know, uh, like radical days to just be a part of that movement because everybody was there. You know, it wasn't just Native Americans, it was everybody there, and they were there unified against the cause that was against all of humanity, which was the way that capitalism and consumption was attempting to uh, utilize, to, to achieve its own interests at the uh, expense of everybody else. And the Native Americans had a beautiful metaphor for it, they call it the pipeline, they call it the black snake. And I love the metaphor because it's mixing metaphors. You know, if you want to be black and proud, then it's hard to see 
any, any redemption in the black snake, but it was just such a beautiful metaphor of the oil pipeline snaking through people's lands and spreading its poisonous venom and squeezing the life out of everybody that it came in contact with. And of course, the, com the combination of you know, capitalism and white supremacy is what they were standing against. And so rather than white people seeing themselves as allies, you know, they were, you know, the difference between witness and withness. They were with it because their own interests were just as much linked. And so I think that we have to continue to struggle with how do we continue to widen the aperture to include, you know, more and more people who want to deal with the most pressing problems that we have, which are capitalism, and issues of ideologies that attempt to marginalize and, and other everyone. And just last thing as I'm thinking about it, the terminology that I think that we're, we're working toward is, is, is what Toni Morrison is saying and what John Powell is saying, the notion of othering. Rather than just using racial categories, I think the dynamics of how people are othered in every society and how they are othered internally within societies that look from the outside to be uh, uniform and yet, if you don't eat sushi and you don't have enough base on your radio, maybe you don't belong in that society. I'll stop there. I, I still <laughs> hope you. the judge in you, I still hope it's going to happen. I'm a romantic at heart. <laughs> That's a romanticized uh, part in my Isha. And we know each other l a little longer, so I know that, of course, that was. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, given the time, I mean, I, I have so many questions um, and I would like to connect that, but uh, given the time, uh, time, I will also group my, my questions. Um, just a very short obs observation. Also, what you just said, I, f I feel like that this is a really, really good method to uh, deconstruct whiteness. Yeah. But also, and we have to repeat that all over again, because since in race we deeply embedded the other ring already, whiteness often fell, fell out of it. And it does kind of um, shaking the system and the foundation of the system by, by thinking to say, well, uh, microcultural identities as whiteness. That is really what, what I take here and, and, and it really sparks me uh, uh, very, very much. Um, uh, so two questions which are very quick, uh, uh, shortly, oh, I tried to do it very shortly. The first one is actually connecting to um, one question from, from Aisha about the recognition. Um, we both, uh, together with Katya Kinder, happen to be um, in a scientific uh, uh, group um, right now, moderating, um, uh, um, working on a consultation process of the, uh, with, with the uh, land of the, the, the state of Berlin for the um, United Nations decade for, the, for people of African descent, which is uh, declared uh, by the United Nations in 2015 and runs a whole decade for 2024. So almost every country signed on to it, um, but uh, doesn't do so much about it yet. And in the US also, there is not much going on in recognition of, the, uh, of this decade for people of African descent. However, the state of Berlin actually started that and we started right now and, and uh, for this year a consultation pro process to make the discrimination of people of African descent um, visible to the uh, government of Berlin. Basically they uh, acknowledged um, they need help with that um, because we, as you already uh, pointed out and your book uh, shows that, we know what the discrimination is. Um, so, in, but one of the uh, uh, foundings, what we um, uh, uh, now are wrapping up in this process, is um, that um, we, for example, we in, in Germany, we need solid data on um, the situation of people of African descent. We are not even recognized as a group. So, one part also of what, what we see in this. Um, uh, uh, United Nations decade is to achieve this recognition as a, as a group of people of African descent because otherwise we are falling out of all other categories or getting you know the markation of other ca categories we talked about that a little bit um, uh, early on on migration background you know somebody is not getting a migration background a white 
white person from England, for example, you know, has not been uh, uh, signed on a migration background. But people uh, like me being born in Germany, I make, migrated from the south of Germany to Berlin, <laughs> I'm, I have a migration background. So that is a problem, of course. <laughs> I mean, it's more a structural problem. So a very crucial part of our work here is to do uh, everything to get us this recognition as a group. So my question would be, how does this work, you know, with at the same time your concept of um, multicultural identities? And the second short part is, Maisha already mentioned it, um, uh, one part of my work is on black radical imagination and um, on Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. And deconstructing always have, has something to do with that. This is already lying in this field. Um, I should point that uh, out uh, uh, also. And I'm wondering that, um, uh, so, so I see that part in your, in, in your concept to deconstruct something in, you know, how do you work maybe with, or, or how does the notion of imagination and the imagination of a different identity in the future works um, with your concept. You talked about the inner humanity, but this is exactly what um, in the African diaspora is very often debated. You know, like um, if humanity means the racism we experience every t uh, day, if humanity means slavery and and colonialism, we can't have this. Oh, that's not our humanity. I mean, this is what Sun Ra said, you know, space is a place. Maybe we can't possibly be from the space. So what would we say about that? First, there's a difference between space and place <laughs> because placemaking in space is where you bring the artifacts of your existence to make that space recognizable. So you could also talk about that from the standpoint of what kinds of places can we create that make people feel welcomed uh, when they are coming from a variety of backgrounds and experiences. I just want to you know, just echo that point because it's so, be uh, so beautiful. Here's a consideration. So I'm an older guy, and, uh, and I feel like I can be idiosyncratic you know, because I've had this longer life and I can sort of like reflect on this thing. And I think the issue is, I mean, one, I was in those struggles, you know, trying to get recognized for the discrimination and, and, and racism that was going on uh, against black people. But I think we have to disaggregate. And so rather than use the term deconstruct, let's, let's play with the term disaggregate. Because unless we disaggregate first to get down to uh, the positionalities that people actually inhabit, which could be communities of practice, but they could also be very, very different uh, in terms of what is being accepted under the big umbrella of the African diaspora. So let me give you a quick example. So there was a report out on uh, the wealth of uh, people in LA, and they broke it down into like eight or nine categories. Wealth of um, whites, which they didn't disaggregate, which was interesting. Let's say it was $360,000 of, uh, of, 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 of uh, wealth that they had accumulated. And then they had uh, broken down the Asian group into uh, Koreans and uh, Japanese and uh, Chinese. And it was sort of interesting because by them disaggregating the Asian group, uh, you saw that the Koreans were doing much more poorly in terms of wealth than the Japanese and the Chinese. And so Again, just sort of specifying, well, we have a, you know, problems with well, Asians need to be, you know, well, it's just like that's a problem because not all of the Asian groups, and we didn't even get into Vietnamese and Hmong and, 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 and other groups that are even more marginalized. But then it also showed that the Africans who were in uh, Los Angeles from Africa were doing about five times better than the African Americans. And we also saw this. Well, I don't, I don't even want to go there, but <laughs> but we also saw the same thing with the Harvard study where they were bragging about we have like three to four percent black. And then when they disaggregated, it was like half of those people were from African countries and maybe children of, you know, people who had much, much more wealth. So if you're trying to be equitable and you're still allowing these mega categories to be the definitive spaces that you're using to say, you know, black people need more of this or Latinos need more of that without, 
And what I, I would, would suggest is that as you begin, it's sort of like when we look at the gender issue, okay, the fluidity that's there, as soon as you break through, you know, heteronormativity in a simple binary, then you're opening up a space for multiple positionalities that can exist that don't necessarily oppress you, but they liberate you, and they also allow you to see continuities and affinities and connections with others who may be at similar places on the spectrum. And even that spectrum itself is not finite, because tomorrow it might be different. You have, may have moved into a different spot on the same spectrum. So I have a, a colleague, um, uh, Mark uh, Dumas, uh, Michael Dumas in the United States, who does a lot with Afrofuturism and Afro, uh, you know, the, the, the black imaginary. And I love it, you know, it's like good stuff. But I have to say that in many cases, it's a fictive imagination, that we have created fictive kinship communities, that we have defined what we consider to be, you know, our kinship community, but it's, a lot of times, it is imagined around ideals. You know, so we were saying it loud and we were black and we were proud, but it was like glorifying what we thought were like the, 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 the super things about being black and negating all of the other things of the, you know, uh, fratricide and the uh, domestic violence and the sexual violence and all of those kinds of things. That was airing dirty laundry. So when, 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 when um, Walker, when, uh, she, when Alice Walker came out with uh, the color purple, the black community, men in the black community resisted that. They thought like, what, what right does she have to tell, you know, we're struggling to, to come online and not be oppressed as men. We need to be built up and bolstered by our sisters and, you know, so that we can get out there and fight the man, right? But women's struggles inside of those, when those men were coming home, needed to be aired. And so this, it's, that, it's that uneasy, you know, uh, dynamic of recognizing that you want to have a sense of home, a sense of collectiveness, a sense of community, but at the same time being aware that the boundaries around which that community gets drawn is also a part of the process of othering everyone else who is outside of those boundaries. I don't know if I'm quite answering your question, but I'll yeah. think about it some more on the plane tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Can I mean, I jump I in a little bit. Is there time for me to jump into that? I, I, I'd like to jump in at two points. One, okay. one, one thing, very shortly. Very one shortly. thing is is with a with a Afrofuturism or or using it loosely, a speculative fiction. Uh, nothing against fiction per se. We need fiction mm -hmm. um, um, and, and imaginings to, to also to be able to uh, uh, have symbolic uh, uh, systems that 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 can. Um, inspire us to move into ways of being. Uh, Moonlight, for example, the film Moonlight, uh, which, which is not, it, it, it makes, it, it, it talks about loss and, 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 and uh, realities of, of, of multiple marginalization, but also of aesthetics, and then com complexity of blackness, looking at the Cuban, uh, uh, the, the Cuban diasporan uh, a figure in it. So I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to like, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to say I take the point that some of it is over idealized, and then silences, that we, we, we create multiple silences because we're trying to have this very glorified picture. Uh, but I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to make the point that Octavia Butler, obviously, and Toni Morrison's work is also very futuristic, or very speculative. Looking at be, uh, beloved, beloved, you don't really know on what level you are in some, some cases. But I'm speaking about the film here. I haven't read the book. I should read the book, maybe. Uh, so I should say Oprah, because Oprah did the film. That was not helpful. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was about the train. Um, I, I, there's, it's, it's resonating very much with me and, and, and I can relate to it very much. I, I still am not completely sure how we're going to reconcile this with the place in which we are, the lateness of, of, of even getting affirmative action for black people of African heritage in, in, in Germany. So I understand, I understand very much, resonate very much with what you're saying, that we have to make things visible in more complex and more and, and, and look at more of where we inhabit. That's why we, we try to, to go to uh, Afro shops or to different areas where people people's voices who, people, who won't come to political meetings, but they have a political opinion that's important to the process that we're, we, uh, that we're, we're making. So um, 
that point is taken. And uh, I'm still worried about how we're going to reconcile that with, I like when you talked about mega categories, reminds me of mega churches. And, and we know uh, that these mega churches are obviously extremely problematic. So the mega categories are also very problematic. It's an open question. I don't really have a, an, an end. The train, I'm going to say something about a train. So the, I liked when you spoke about the, the meaning of trains for black experiences. Um, and, and I was going to end on, on the same note that Peggy began. So my my mother, my who, who raises as a, as a single mother, her father, um, before colonialism, um, was basically living his life, and then he became a, um, a, a, a cook. He, he cooked in a colonial farm, but when colonialism ended, and he fought in in one of the world wars also for the British side. Uh, my great grandfather in the first war, my second grandfather in the second world war, and uh, he became um, a locomotive. <laughs> Um, Lokfuhrer, what do you call those people? He drove a, a train. Engineer. No, he drove the train. Engineer. An engineer? An engineer? That's what you call it? Okay, I was, I was looking for a driving word, something that says something yeah, exactly. about train driver, but an engineer. <laughs> and uh, for the East African railways, because then we, was, we still had this crazy protectorate craziness going on. And so his family lived in different spaces from where he actually came from, from Kisumu. They lived in Morogoro, which is in Tanzania. And uh, and then they lived in Sagana, which is a part that's of, of a Kikuyu-speaking community that's also very far away from wh where we come from. We come from Barack Obama country. We're very proud of it. So we are not as she successful as the Nigerians, there. but we have Barack Obama, so <laughs> there. <laughs> and I, I wanted to say that because it's 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 relevant to my biography, and I can't even say how relevant it is. But using your perspective, it it it's making me think about these things and about how they have meaning. So I want to end on that opening, on, on, uh, and, and I want to say as an educator, especially as an educator of color, it makes total sense to me to say we have to make the, the different forces and the different uh, impacts contradictory and uh, um, multiple impacts more visible so we can also make more sense of them and, and, and make the, create those spaces that are going to make people coming from plural backgrounds be able to be at ease. So I, that's why I want to end. I really like that thought. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we are a little bit pressed for time, but uh, we should take the opportunity to, uh, well, yeah, to talk with the audience so we can take a couple of questions, uh, comments. Um, yeah, we have a microphone in the, in the back. So please go ahead. Werte verbinden mehr als Herkunft. Value um, bind more than uh, origin can separate, whether it's a, a, a ethnic origin or color. Well, why don't you look at the current problems and work on them uh, such that you bring that to the next level, that you blink all of this? Uh, to who is that question directed? That's, uh, that's your decision. Why don't you uh, supply the uh, existing uh, problems to a higher level on the level of values, on the level of what binds people, what connects people? Okay, let's connect, uh, collect a, more, a couple of more questions in. Um, hello. Thanks. Terror was my name. I studied uh, European ethnology. Uh, I'm currently uh, running an education an educators training. And here, uh, participation is a very important issue. And I, I try to uh, bring what was said here uh, into the German situation. We have enormous, uh, lots of categories in Germany. Not black and white, necessarily, but German, foreigner, and then a couple of new uh, uh, terms were invented over time. Currently, um, uh, what's current is um, uh, human beings with a migrant background. That is, uh, I think, uh, what's fashionable or what's the usual talk or the usual denomination. And uh, we're also looking for ways to uh, uh, grasp the fluidity of uh, a culture. I think this is a very important aspect. But I hope that you also mentioned the title of uh, this uh, 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 talk here, of this uh, uh, conference. How can you uh, use this approach of fluid do away with all these categories, so to speak. Uh, how can you 
transfer to the relatively unexperienced migrant society that Germany is. I would be very pleased if you uh, could give me a hint here. Uh, I will talk in English. You mentioned disaggregating communities to be able to, from how I understood it, to be able to go out and grab people where they are and invite them, in a sense, towards the community, but also to understand where, um, where their difficulties lie, where their struggles lie. And maybe possibly, if I understood it correctly, um, see what we're missing when we're in, together in the community, you know, fighting the good fight, um, do you see that as a permanent situation or do you see it more, you also mentioned about moving the center of the community, do you see it more as a, a temporary situation to kind of get, oh, now I'm speaking English like German, get new gas <laughs> or um, get new energy? I mean, do you, is it something permanent or do you see it as something temporary or does it not fall within that binary? Okay, so can mm -hmm. I start with that? Yes, and sure. The, uh, it's, it's a great question and, um, and you were putting your finger on it in terms of talking about fluidity. One, I think it's a permanent situation and it's always been going on anyway, so it's not like it's new and we discovered you know, multiple, you know, positionality in the 21st century. Uh, the analogy I like to use, the comparison I like to use is in the, in the United States again, when I was growing up in high school, it was not, you could be very oppressed by coming out as a gay man or woman. And that group, and particularly in the black community, by the way, and people who had different orientations beyond heteronormativity struggled against being put into one category or the other. So there was just two choices there, binary. And we're saying there are five choices that white supremacy is offering people, you know, in terms of in the United States. And I think that that analogy that there are fluid positionalities that exist that need to be uh, accepted for what they are. And that what's interesting is that after 50 years, even though that struggle was predicated on the feminist struggle and the black liberation struggle and the black arts movement and other kinds of things, the civil rights struggle, we find in 2018 a much higher appreciation for ways that people may want to represent themselves along the terms just of you know sexual orientation. And I guess my argument is that why can't we also get to that point? It may take another 50 years also for that to happen, but if, and, and there's an example in the book of a, a guy that I'm calling Ryan, who he was identified as a white man. He was six feet tall, he was very physical, but he was teaching in a school that was all African-American boys, for example, for the, for the most part, because it was a continuation high school. So these were kids who were kicked out of the regular high school. And it was, it was just um, the, the, the hyper-masculinity in the school was so, uh, per, you know, so permeable. I mean, so it permeated everything that was going on, even the teachers who were all male. And they, you know, boasted about, you know, that they could, you know, kick any one of the students, butt whenever they needed to, they were, you know, really physical and hypermasculine. And he noticed that the young people that he was working in the school who didn't have that representation were really marginalized. And to this day, I don't even know what his sexual orientation is, but he always pushed back because he would just do something like wear a silky shirt that had like uh, hearts on it and a, a really thin belt that he called his lady belt. And, and, the, and the men in this class, these young men, they were like, so, you know, Mr. S, what, you know, what, 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 what's, what's, what's with that belt? What's with that shirt? He said, oh, yeah, this is my, my roommate gave me this belt. I love this belt, man. And, and then somebody would say, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that is kind of cool. And then they were like, oh, yeah, that's saucy. That's, that's wet. That's, you know. 
But the whole point is, and, and so one day the guy, he says, and this is in the book, he says, well, a guy, you know, pulls him to the side and says, Mr. S, what are you really? And he says, okay, I'm going to tell you. Because he didn't look like, he, he was like a cisgender looking male. He rode his mountain bike across the country, he rock climbed, all of these kinds of things. You know, he wrote, had a pickup truck, he had a big dog. <laughs> so, not a little dog. So he said, I'm going to tell you. But first, I want to uh, just get from you. <clears throat> Do you, um, after I tell you, I mean, is it going to change our relationship? We've been working together for six months now. I'm, I'm your teacher. You're my student. And, you know, is it going to change the way you feel about me once I, you know, tell you what, what my orientation is? Oh, no, no, Mr. S. Of course not, man. I'm just, you know, just interested. He said, then. If it's not going to change our relationship, then why do you need to know? Because this, isn't this the most important thing? And so this idea, though, that we as human beings are pattern recognizers, that we need to create categories in order to have meaning, and that it's impossible to even read. I cannot read the, 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 this page if there's not black letters contrasting with the black, with the white. But the problem of taking that to an extreme of needing to fix everybody into a category is all, the only thing I'm attempting to resist. And I think like those movement people who have challenged our perceptions of how people can be oriented sexually and created a spectrum of positionalities that people can exist in, I think that race also has been just as limiting as the older versions of heteronormativity versus, you know, uh, straight or, you know, or, you know, like male or female, gay or straight, that these same kinds of constructs that have been problematic and people didn't fit are just as um, easy to, that are, are just as powerful as to struggle against around these issues of race. Mm. Uh, Maisha, do you questions? No, there were three and I... I you, you're leaving me with a value question. You want me to, you, you want to say something to the values? To bring it to a higher value and uh, focus more on what connects us. I think that these are <clears throat> the, 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 uh, these are the, 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 the most important human values. These are the highest values. Um, the, the idea, <clears throat> and, and, and one of the things, so I've had the fortune to be able to travel around to a bunch of countries and all over the United States. And that is, I mean, we're going back to the train metaphor that we really all need to be on the train and, 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 and going to stops and getting off and enjoying, you know, and appreciating and trying to understand uh, because it's the relationships. This is back to my guy, Mr. S, that we transform our understanding of the other by actually having relationships with those people. And when we struggle in relationships with them, I think that that increases the um, appreciation and respect for what was the other because the most fundamental value is how do we uh, work against oppression in all of the ways that it manifests itself. Uh, gender oppression, racial oppression, uh, socioeconomic oppression, there's geographical oppression, all kinds, I mean, it's a whole litany. And so we don't have relationships that allow us to see, and this is why I said the ethnographic perspective. You know, Delheim said that everybody in the society Certainly there should be people who are, are experts in, in this way of making meaning out of the world, but everyone in the society should have a way of making meaning in a process that's ethnographic in character, that to be able to step back, to be the listener, to see, uh, allow people to represent themselves on their own terms. This is not that you have to agree with them, but I don't think we have opportunities yet for people to uh, get to that point yet. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're at the end. We are we're running end. out of time. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Can you? Maisha, yeah. Very shortly, please. Very shortly before Mekon <laughs> loses it. Um, I'm going to say it in German. So I'm, I'm going to say something about the value question. Um, also, ich würde gerne drei Dinge sagen. I would like to share uh, three things with you in terms of the question. So I will be uh, saying th three things about that evaluation. The way I understand Professor Mahiri, uh, friendly provocations, uh, these three things, so not uh, directed to you, but to this to the subject of the values. 
the concept of uh, Professor Mahiri, I understand it such. When we talk about values, they uh, generate in these uh, micro uh, interaction, in the subjective relationships. It's a bottom-up approach. The second thing that we'd like to say is that there is an implied criticism. What we understand to be values are top-down values like democracy, uh, progress, uh, linear uh, progression, things that uh, come from, from if you have then these mega churches, the, the mega, I think these are mega values. And that's the third thing that we'd like to say. They, they are um, stained. Um, in oh, colonialism, gender hierarchies, uh, and hetero patriarchy, and therefore they are not neutral, these values. And that is the point w where we are in porous times in the society. That's where we are with right wing po uh, populism, with Trumpism and Viktor Orban and the like, and these phenomenon with Brexit, which presumably will not happen, which would be good. Um, 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 so we've come to all of this because we still believe in, in these mega concepts of, um, uh, and that's how I understand, Ms. Professor. We have to be messy. We have to be courageous and uh, do it small scale. Uh, have dialogue. Uh, and when I uh, think what it means for us, it uh, is worrying. But it is better than to have Trumpism. Thank you, Maisha. What is left for me to say is to uh, add to what was on the title of this uh, conference here, of this talk. We should have um, had more time. Uh, you must come back, Professor Maire. We need a talk. Uh, we couldn't talk uh, and cover all. Um, but one important thing is, specifically in Germany, uh, we, we, it was mentioned here, a young migration society has little uh, uh, experience in terms of migration. We need to first understand what is to be deconstructed, who is to be deconstructed, what we really mean when we say that. Otherwise, uh, we jump to uh, too fast conclusions. Uh, we already then know or presume uh, we know what our target audiences are, that uh, and educational justice is only some additive. Um, that's why I like this uh, story with this, the metaphor with this, uh, with this train. It's not about uh, hanging another coach there and uh, adding another chapter, but rather deconstruct the train and check where there is participatory opportunities for people we haven't even mentioned here. And that's why. Um, our guest and speaker that you offered us um, yeah, the insight in your work and also give, uh, give us a lot of uh, food for thoughts, what we can use for our work here in Germany. And I hope that is um, only the beginning of a uh, transatlantic uh, exchange of uh, African diasporic um, uh, meaning in uh, educational system. And I also want to thank uh, Maisha Auma um, for uh, uh, your commentary and questions and um, of course your long years experience in the field of uh, education here in uh, Germany as well. Thank you so much. Please help me.